that governs how your financial statements are prepared and how these rules are actually put in practice. Okay? Then we'll talk about, and, and today we are going to start with the concept of approval. And, and you, will, you will clearly see that it is, a, it, is, it is the cornerstone of all the accounting that we do. Okay? Uh, you know, I don't know, given time, I may go into the conceptual framework, uh, then, uh, then, then we'll go into the transactions, and probably we'll start with them today, and we will end with them tomorrow. So, so by tomorrow, we should have, you should be comfortably, uh, you know, looking at how we prepare, and I'll have you do some problems here in class, so that you get a practice of what, what is it that you're talking about. Okay. And it will it'll also break the monotony of me talking all the time, it's not good. So, uh, so we need to, we need to have, you know, have you do things. Oh, and by the way, I also want to emphasize this. The one way you are not going to learn this subject is by reading the book alone. You are going to learn it only by doing it. This, this stuff never comes by reading a book. You can read the book and you can say, oh yeah, it makes sense. Obviously it makes sense, that's why the book is selling. Right? <laughs> but, but, but can you do it yourself? If you cannot do it yourself, then you are you have not learned the material. So that is the reason why I'm I have already you know in the blackboard I have sent a bunch of exercises and problems from the book with not just with the answers but with the complete solutions, meaning from start to the end. So you go through the solutions and you go through them as many times as is needed that you can do it yourself. Once you are at that point, then you are starting to get the hang of things. So therefore, accounting, you need to get your hands dirty by actually doing the stuff and not by just reading the book, skimming the book and saying, oh yeah, this makes perfect sense. It work. I mean, it will when you read it, but after that it may not stick. Yes? Mm -hmm. Would you mind uh, putting on a slideshow? I'm sorry, say that again. It's a little slow. Put on a slideshow. So the letters are bigger. I can put it on presentation mode. Oh, oh, yeah. Absolutely. No, I do that all the I just don't know the names. Mm. Uh, yeah. Is that the one? Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's fine. <clears throat> all right. So, all right. Now, let's go into the financial statements. We, in this course, we will focus on four financial statements. Well, essentially three, but, but, but technically four, okay? The four statements are the income statement, the balance sheet, the statement of cash flows, and the statement of owner's equity. The fourth one, the last one, is something that we won't spend too much time on, but that's something that is important, and it is also part of the actual output that companies produce, all right? So income statement, balance sheet, statement of cash flows, and statement of owner's equity, okay? Now, let me briefly, you know, talk about, uh, generally accepted accounting principles. It is not the law, but it is a consensus that has emerged from all those who are preparing and using financial statements. So that is what is uh, a gap. In the United States, there is, there is an accounting body which is called the Financial Accounting Standards Board. 
this financial accounting standard board is not a government organization. It is actually a private sector organization. It is it comprises of seven members, and there are a bunch of groups that work under this uh, you know financial accounting standards board. The financial accounting standards board is the ultimate authority for telling everybody what the accounting rules are. Okay. Now, what is the government body that has actually the, 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 the regulatory authority over all these companies? That is called the Securities and Exchanges Commission. The Securities and Exchanges Commission is the one that has got the, the enforcement authority, meaning that if you don't prepare your financial statements according to GAAP, then the Securities and Exchanges Commission can actually take you to court. And it can actually get penalties imposed on the senior officers of the firm. Okay, so 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 today the Securities Com Exchanges Commission is taking its job extremely seriously, and there are lots and lots more of uh, you know the senior officers who are now seeing jail time because the SEC is unrelenting in its uh, focus. That is probably traded. I'm sorry. That is probably traded or. It's probably one. Is it publicly traded companies? Or yes, anybody? only publicly traded companies. If you are a private company, if you are a proprietorship or a partnership or something like that, then you come up, you are not in, within the purview of the SEC. So when yeah. Enron fails to do their, their service, that's who to come on board? The Security and Exchange Commission? No, Enron is a private company. So, so Enron failed, and there was a huge investigation into the failure of Enron. And at that point, they came up with the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. But the Securities and Exchanges Commission as a government organization has been around forever. And they had no, no hand in what happened to Enron? Well, sometimes, you know, when you say they had no hand, you could, you could look at it in two ways. One is that they were supposed to do something that they did not do. And the other way of looking at it is that they were actually corrupt. <laughs> corrupt. Corrupt. C O R R U P T. Corrupt. So, so now, you know, you, you, but that was not the case with SEC. With SEC, the most, you know, the most serious, uh, you know, what, whatever accusation people made was that they should have acted and they did not act. Yeah. They, 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 but that's what people say. It's very hard to say these things because what happens is lots of times you go by the legal environment that is prevailing at that point in time. If the legal environment is not conducive to going after wrongdoers in a very big way, or it makes it extremely costly for you to go after the wrongdoers, then what is the government to do? The only way to do that is to change the law. So they brought in the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, which changed the law and made it now much more difficult for companies to, to take uh, you know, accounting rules for a right. So, so they could not do that anymore. Okay. All right. So, so now, how, do, how does FASB actually come up with the rules? They follow due process, meaning that they will say, OK, what is it that they want to do? They'll open it up for comments. They'll open it up for, for at least a month or so for comments to come in. They'll take all the comments. They will address the comments. And then they'll come up with the final rules. So, so FASB follows, uh, you know, what we call as due process. Okay. Now, now here, uh, let's first start getting into the into the nitty gritties of a crew. So, I'm going to set up an example here. It's an example that runs over three years. Okay. And it's a very simple, straightforward example that goes to the heart of what what we call as accrual accounting. So, consider three years: 2010, 11, and 12. Okay, so this is what happens. In 2010, think of it like Home Depot, okay? a company like Home Depot. Okay? It buys inventory for $500. So Home Depot doesn't make stuff. It buys stocks and sells. Right? So now if you think about Home Depot, let us say it bought five lawnmowers for $100 each. Okay? In 2010, they bought the five lawnmowers. But in 2010, they did not pay the supply. So they have not yet paid for those lawnmowers. But it's now Home Depot's lawnmower, so they owe the money to the suppliers. In the same year, let's say each lawnmower costs Home Depot $100. Let us say that they sold four of those, that is $400 worth of lawnmowers. Let's assume that they sold it for $600. So customers came and picked up four lawnmowers from the Home Depot store, and each lawnmower to the customer was $150. 
Simple enough. Now, assume that the customer has not paid yet. In 2010, Home Depot bought five lawn mowers. They didn't pay the supplier. In the same year, the customers from the Home Depot stores, they picked up four lawn mowers. You know, they bought them, and they have not paid Home Depot yet. And let us assume that in the normal course of business, this will get settled, meaning that Home Depot will pay the suppliers and the customer will pay Home Depot. Now, sometime down the road in this class, we will talk about situation, how you handle situations where you, have, you don't expect the customer to pay. How do, you, how do you deal with bad debts and how do you deal with uh, the allowance for uh, doubtful to account and stuff like that. But so that will be later. But for now, let's try to understand the approval concept, yes. Okay, real quick, how can the customer purchase the lawnmower and now pay Home Depot. I'm still confused about that. <coughs> they didn't pay it at that time. So why would they take the lawnmower? Oh, come on. You can you can walk into a furniture store, buy the furniture, and they give you a credit terms. But they, yeah, but you're paying credit. Somebody's paying Home Depot, though. No, oh, that, is a, that is between Home Depot and that somebody, whoever is paying. Some devs are, are in turn. Think about it. Yeah, that is not, that's not your problem. As far as Home Depot, so if I am Home Depot, you are a customer, and she's the supplier. I see, I see. She has she has supplied five lawnmowers to me, so she will expect that I will pay for the five lawnmowers. As a customer, you have picked up four lawnmowers from me. You have taken it home. As the supplier of lawnmowers to you, I expect that you will pay the money. The what the point is that when she delivered the lawnmowers to me, I didn't pay her. And when you picked up the lawnmowers from my store, you did not pay me. That's all there is. Okay, and see. all this happened in 2010. Now the question is, if you, if somebody asks you, did Home Depot make a profit in 2010? Yes. Or no? If, if, it, if it did, how much profits did it make? And if it is no, then we stop right there. Did they make a profit? Yes. Or not? Yes. You would say yes. How many of you, how many of you agree that Home Depot actually will report a profit in 2010? They got a no, 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 I'm not talking 2011. Anyway, they, they got profits. 2010, they got if profit. you ask me how much yeah. profits did Home Depot earn in 2010, 2010, Home Depot has to prepare an income statement. But they have to report their revenues, their expenses, and their profits. Mm -hmm. How much profits will they report in 2010? 200? Oh no, $100. They bought the inventory for $500. That means they dished out $500. Bucks. They're down $500. That's, 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 that's not an asset. asset. They have not paid. Yeah. You have not dished out the $500 yet. So they collect the $400. Yeah, but your debts are against your liabilities. Say that again. Your debts are against your liabilities. So you have a liability to pay. Yes, you do. Okay, so therefore. So let's first let's first understand what is profit. Profit sells. Profit exactly. Minus, profit minus in cost. a period, and we will call this. So in, in our example, in this period is 2010. Profits for the year 2010 are equal to revenues minus cost. Revenues minus, and the accounting term is expenses, not costs. Okay. Costs and expenses are different in an accounting sense, and you have to be careful with that. Yeah. Costs don't become expenses, and sometimes costs and expenses are the same. So, so while we move forward, we will understand that. When a cost is immediately an expense, and when a cost is not an expense immediately. Is revenue considered uh, uh, an income when you haven't paid for it? That is the point. So now we go into the concept of approval. The accrual concept says revenue, to consider something as revenue, it needs to meet only two tests. The first test is that has it been earned? Meaning that have you done, as Home Depot, have you done what you are supposed to do to earn that revenue? Have you or not? Yes. You have delivered the product. What else can you do? Well, that's the, that's, a sep that's a separate point. But from your point of view, you had a product in your showroom, uh, in, your, in your store, the customer came, picked it up, there is a signature which says that, yeah, you have delivered the product, the customer has taken the product home. So 
So you've done what you have to do. You have earned it. Mm -hmm. Right? Second, is this revenue already realized? Meaning now we are talking payment. Is it already realized or is it realizable? This is the key. Mm -hmm. The difference between realized and realizable is that realized means it's a cash sale. The customer, when they pick up the long, uh, pick up the long, uh, I mean, long mower, they pay cash. That's that means it is realized. If the come, if the customer just writes a note saying that I owe you five hundred and fifty dollars, now it's realizable. Now, under the normal course of business, every company has you know sells items on credit. Why? Because they want to improve their sales, so you do sell on credit. So when you sell on credit, then you are on the realizable side. So now the question is, if you have earned it and you have either realized or realized or it is realizable in that period of time, so that's where the period comes in. Mm -hmm. So in the year 2010, have you earned it? And is the money already realized or realizable? realizable. If the answer to both the questions is yes, then it's revenue. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter that the cash was received. So it doesn't have to be realized. It has to be either realized or realizable in the normal course of business. Mm -hmm. So from, from that argument, you, know, you can clearly say in this particular example, Home Depot has delivered the four lawnmowers to the customers. So it is earned and they have sold it on credit, so which means there is an invoice on the customer. And so in the normal course of business, you expect the customer to pay. So it's realizable. Question. And that's a throw a monkey punch, but I am because in healthcare, that's what I want to understand. You have people that are undocumented that have a bill. They never have to pay that bill because they really can't be found. So, how is that revenue? Or not? It's a, it's a difficult, it's a, it, it is a tough question. Uh, so, no, no, let me just answer it from an accounting point of view. From an accounting point of view, all I would say is that. Yes, it qualifies as realizable, but when we do the advanced work in terms of bad debts, you will have to provide, you will call it receivable, but you will reduce that receivable by a very high allowance to the extent that it is receivable from people that you don't expect to pay. So, so reduce it. No, you will consider it a profit. So, so, so what I'm saying is that you will call it, so, so let us say, let, 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 let's just say that as we are talking this questionable revenue of, let's say, $1 million, mm -hmm. and you don't expect, let's say, 80% of this to come to come back to you. Mm -hmm. Let's say only 20% will come back to you. Mm -hmm. So you will report the $1 million as revenue, and then in the expenses, you will say bad debt expenses of $800. So, so it, does not, it does not violate the revenue rule but at the same time, later on when you, because obviously this is all going into receivables. So what you will do is you will reduce the receivables by 800,000 and at the same time you will call that an expense for the period. So your profits for the period will be 1 minus 800 or just 200,000 dollars. Right? Question? So professor, we said we had a hundred dollars in revenue, but wouldn't you have another? No, no, no. I never said hundred dollars in revenue. I'm not even there yet. Oh. I never said. All I said was the fact that the cash was not received does not disqualify it from becoming revenue. Oh, okay. Well, now we got to figure out exactly how much the revenue is. Oh, so that was my next question. Though. Okay. So, so first let's let's figure out. Now, under this rule, the 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 earned and the realized or realizable rule. How much is revenue in 2010? <laughs> How much revenue did the company earn in 2010? 250. 600 dollars. Right? Perfect. Spend money on, no, no, hang on, hang on. We'll get to the we'll get to the expenses revenue, later. We are talking only revenues. If you have if you have sold four lawnmowers to me, how much do I owe you for those four lawnmowers? 500. Two fifty a lawnmower. What? It's 150, right? Oh, I mean, we said, yeah, we said it's, oh, no, 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 I've already said $600. How much do I owe you now? I have not paid the 600 so how much do I owe you? $600. $600. That's your revenue. Because it's realizable. So, realize, no. 
It's not. No, no. I, I just want to technically correct you. It's not that you're getting ahead of yourself. It's a wrong answer. It's important to understand the difference between the two. You got ahead of yourself by by confusing revenues and profits, which is very common at the beginning. So the question is revenues. So 600, exactly as he pointed out, 600 is your revenue. Now we will figure out what the expenses are and then compute profits as revenues minus that. Right? That's important to keep in mind. Revenues and profits are not the same. So in a period when your profits are zero, you still had revenues. Except that the revenues and the expenses were exactly equal, so your profits were zero. Of course, you can technically have a period in which revenues are zero and expenses are zero, so profits are zero. But the important point is that profits are equal to revenues minus expenses. So what we have now agreed, hopefully, is that the company earned $600 in revenue. Is, that, is everybody comfortable with that? Yes. Under, under this rule? Yes. I mean, you may not be comfortable in the sense, oh, I never got the money, why am I calling it revenue? But that's not what the rule says. The rule says to call something revenue, you got to meet these two tests. Yes, yes. If you meet the two tests, you got you got the revenue. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Do you have to pay taxes on the real before you collect? Now that's a different matter. Now, now, now you're looking. At, now you're going into taxes. No, no, no. That's fine. I know. I know. That question always comes up. So, so one of my limitations in this course. One of my limitations in this course is that I don't like music during my class. <laughs> One of my limitations in this course is that I'm not a tax person. Okay. So the tax rules are something else. I talk about what the company will report in its financial statements to its shareholders, to the government, to the banks, to everybody. Now, from that point of view, yes, this is revenue. Now, I can just briefly answer your question. So, so, so basically, you know, you know the, to, to some extent, I can answer a tax question. And, and to that extent, I can answer, tax gives you an option of either calling only cash received as revenue or accrual basis. So can, I mean, tax, the tax return, if you, are a, if you are a sole proprietor of a business, then you can actually count your revenues through your bank statement. You can take all your bank receipts as your revenues and all the bank payments as your expenses. Cash, I mean, tax, tax uh, you know, law allows you to do that. But if you are a really big business, a very complicated business, you which is, you interest. will always, you will always go by the gap. Just pay it and then you get the interest. Yes. Uh, I like watching Shark Tank a lot. Mm -hmm. It increases equity. When revenues exceed expenses in that in a given period of time, then in that period of time, that excess has increased your equity by that amount. The profits will increase equity. Equity is changed by three things. One is that you putting money into the business directly. Let's say, let's say you're an owner of a business. And you transfer money from your personal bank account to the business bank account. That is one way to increase your equity. Because equity, now we are talking about your business account. In your, your business, your equity has just gone up because you, you contributed money into your company. Right? You're the owner, you contributed money into your company, your equity has gone up. The second way the equity goes up is through profits. When you make a profit in a year, that increases equity. That's the second way equity changes. The third way equity changes is through dividends. When you pay yourself a dividend out of the profits that the company has earned, that reduces equity. Now you are distributing the equity back to yourself. So after you have generated equity, your business has got equity, you can, you can write a check from the bank account back to you. That's called a distribution. When you make a distribution of your profits from the company back to you, and, and uh, we will assume that legally you are entitled to do so, then that reduces your equity in the business. Now your equity has gone down because you have you've taken away your equity, converted it into cash, and you take it taken it home. So, so there are three ways equity will change. You directly contribute money into the business. The business makes money through profits or losses. 
losses will reduce equity. And the third way is that you pay yourself a dividend, where you're distributing the equity back to yourself. Okay. Okay. All right. So, so, so we, are, we are all agreed that in 2010, revenues are equal to $600. Now let's talk about expenses. How much are your expenses in 2010? 500. 500. No. Yeah, that's a reasonable answer. But it's not the right answer. It's a very reasonable answer. 500 is your expenses. But expenses, the important thing about the expenses is that they must match revenues. So if 600 is your revenue, expenses must have been incurred in earning that $600 of revenue. How much expenses did you incur in earning the $600 of revenue? Zero. It's inventory costs, right? Operation costs. No, we don't know about that. Exactly. We don't know about power, we don't know about salaries, we don't know about all that. Is there an expense that was incurred in earning the $600 of revenue? No. The four lawnmowers yes. that got sold. What about the cost of those? The cost of the four lawnmowers that you have sold, you no longer have that with you. That's an expense. So therefore, your expenses are $400. Basically, the cost of the four lawnmowers that you sold, we call it cost of goods sold. Cost of goods sold for businesses like Home Depot, Walmart, Kmart, uh, you know, all these com uh, you know, trading type of companies, cost of goods sold is the most significant expense. In the cost of goods sold, what we are doing is that if somebody, you know, if you are at a Walmart store, you walk out with an item from the Walmart store, what is the cost of goods sold? It is what Walmart has either paid or will pay for that item that it sold to you. That's an expense. So if Walmart paid, let's say, $20 for that item, and it sells it to you for $25, their revenue is $25, and their expenses are $20. So they made a $5 profit right there. It doesn't matter that you, whether you paid your $25 to Walmart, or Walmart has paid the $20 to its supplier. It doesn't matter. The fact that you walked out of the store, and you owe Walmart $25, or you've already paid, doesn't matter whichever way it is. Walmart has earned $25 of revenue from that transaction, and Walmart has incurred an expense of $20 from that transaction. So now you can ask the question, oh, that item was sitting in the Walmart shelf for so long. Where did the $20 go? The point is that it's an asset. Walmart bought an asset and put it in the store. It, Walmart owns it. The $20 item is owned by Walmart. Now you as a customer, you come, pick up the item, walk away from the, through the, uh, you know, cashier. So now they have, that is converted to a cost of goods sold or an expense. It's an expense that is now matched against the revenue they have earned from you, which is $25. So in that one transaction, Walmart made a profit of $5. If all they did in that one year uh, was only sell that one item to you, then their profits for that year is $5, that's it. 